Hello subscribers and people that randomly come to my channel and watch drone stuff. This is the Dead Cat Apex HD. This is like the latest and greatest Mr. Steel custom quad that has come out in 2022. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it and then we're gonna build one. So this is the Apex Dead Cat. As you can see, here's the standard Apex and here is the Dead Cat. You can see the geometry is slightly different. Um, but normally with dead cat frames, you push the the arms wider in the front so that it gets more prop out of shot for your FPV camera or even the HD camera if you want to run lower uh, lower angles. Because if you obviously fly like this and you're tilted really crazily, you're not really going to have props in the shot. But as soon as you start going a little bit slower and having the camera neutral, there can be props in shot on a frame like this because they stick so far forward. And that's really the 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 original application for a dead cat. However, my application was for live streaming, um, especially with DJI, because you can actually run out of, the smart, out of the goggles into the smart controller, and then you can run HDMI out of that and have it direct live stream, and that's a great application to be used for the DJI FPV system. And this frame is built around that, so there's no props in shot for this camera, which is the one that it would actually be live streaming out of. So it's a really high quality frame, as you can expect from Impulse RC. It has all interchangeable parts from the other Apexes. So if you break an arm in the front, it's a five inch arm. Break an arm in the back, it's a six inch arm. The only things that have changed on this are the key in the center and the top, the bottom two lower plates, because obviously the geometry has changed and we needed to change those. But all the other parts are interchangeable with the other Apex, including the top plate. Um, the camera plates are slightly different, which we'll get to, but you could technically use the same camera plates if you wanted. Now, the other things that it comes with, I'll go through when we're actually building it brand new, but this is ultimately what it's going to look like. It's specifically designed to be used with DJI FPV and either a CADX or in this particular case, it has an air unit in it. And, you know, everything else is going to be kind of tailored towards what I use, which would be like Fettec Electronics, Mr. Steel Motors, TBS, uh, if you're running a video transmitter or camera like TBS camera run cam camera or TBS video transmitter run cam camera but in case this case we're running DJI so it's pretty much just Mr. Steel ethics motors impulse RC frame DJI electronics and Fettec flight controller and ESC and then we're running crossfire and I'll get to that when we talk about uh, this frame in, in particular I run crossfire with all of my HD setups and the reason I do that is because I don't typically fly freestyle with HD. I do that with analog still. So when I'm flying far away and I want really good video from my HD system, I just don't want to worry about my radio link. So I just go ahead and run a crossfire and I've had no issues with it. And I just pair those two together. So crossfire and HD uh, or DJI and then analog and tracer. And the reasoning for that is just lower, lower latency and uh, more consistent latency with analog. So yeah, for freestyle, still running the standard Apex. Uh, Mr. Steel Edition, which unfortunately isn't available, and I'll talk about that more in a later video. But yeah, this build, it, this video is specifically for the Dead Cat Apex. So let's go ahead and get right into building it. So as you will see on the table right here, here's pretty much everything that you would get if you purchased all the things that I would recommend for a Dead Cat Apex, and that would include the Dead Cat Apex Mr. Steel Edition itself, that comes with the brown uh, brown or coyote brown uh, plastics. It also comes with black plastics for the front lip, the under the arm skids, and the rear crossfire mount. It also comes with two 3D printed pieces. This is for a GoPro with a 2.5 mil screw, also eight, eight millimeter um, at hex key right here. This is a pretty cool piece instead of having that stupid twist thing on the side that always gets in the way. And then this mount right here, which is going to work with the Vista because that's ultimately what I kind of designed this frame around because the Vista at the time was 6S compatible and I'm running this all on 6S. As far as electronics, I am going to be running a Fettec 45 amp ESC. And as far as the flight controller, we'll be running a, uh, a G4 flight controller from Fettec as well. Wow, I just like bent my fingernail backwards trying to get that open. So yeah, I'll open these up. So Fettec G4 and uh, yeah, that 45 amp Fettec ESC. Uh, we're gonna be running, like I said earlier, a crossfire receiver on this particular one. It will be a nano crossfire because I don't need diversity. I'm just gonna go ahead and run a single antenna Immortal T nano crossfire. And then we will, for motors, we'll be running Mr. Steel Stouts uh, in white. So these are 1750 KV 23 
06 um, motors. And these are the motors that I run on my analog and uh, HD setups. And we'll probably run these with the taller pants, which I'll talk about when we start putting those on. As far as the video system, we're going to be running a Vista Pro, which is the 120 FPS camera, which is what I recommend if you're going to be flying these. I don't think a 60 FPS camera is good enough. I think 120 FPS is the bare minimum. And then the CADX Vista is pretty much the smaller form factor that takes success. I think some of the new air units do success as well, but the smaller form factor I do enjoy. And I don't necessarily ever record on the drone itself, so I don't really need the air unit for anything. If you want to go crazy like and have no issues whatsoever and you're just gung-ho going with the air unit like I will be for certain builds, um, then you know you can go with the air unit, but it fits in both. This comes with a Vista, or it doesn't come with it, but that's what I would recommend. And also with the Dead Cat, this is one of the only frames out there that does this currently. And it is uh, an isolate, it comes with an isolation pad that completely isolates all the electronics from the video system from the carbon fiber because carbon fiber is conductive and if you were to have a short and this outside of the Vista is obviously a ground then it will possibly kill your video system as well so this kind of protects you and also staves off maybe some video interference if there were any or any kind of vibrations or electromagnetic interference or electronic interference is coming through the carbon fiber like I said because it is conductive. It also comes with a couple extra things that we're not going to be using, like this rubber uh, battery pad and then also this um, this Velcro battery pad, which is the one that I will be using, and a couple battery straps and files and foam if you want to go super lightweight and you don't want to run the feet. But I've kind of just already said that I can accept the extra weight and the feet will be what I use. Um, as far as straps, we're just using the Ethics Power Straps. I always run a 230 mil and a 250 mil, one in the front, one in the back, the 230 in the rear and the 250 in the front, specifically so that I can wrap down the power cable. Um, the power cable does come with the, with the frame, so you don't have to worry about purchasing an XD60 or anything. So it's pretty much like turnkey as far as the frame comes. You don't have to worry about much. Now I said that the camera plates were different earlier. The camera plates are slightly different and they come with, than the traditional Apex camera plates, they come with these little um, 3D printed pieces that go inside these camera plates and isolate the camera from the carbon fiber, which is, like I said, when you isolate the Vista unit, you need to isolate the camera too because they are all connected under one roof. So that is what these camera plates are designed for and it also comes with the screws that you would need to make that happen. So let's go ahead and just open this stuff up. It, and the Mr. Steel one also comes with aluminum hardware. So this is a lot lighter than the steel hardware that comes with a standard frame. And I guess to differentiate between the Mr. Steel frame and the regular frame, the Mr. Steel frame comes with lightweight hardware. It comes with these two 3D printed things. Um, and it comes with the brown, the brown uh, stuff here. And yeah, I mean, I specifically asked for this frame. So Although there is another frame, like uh, as far as the request for this design, the Dead Cat layout and the Apex, it was like, this is what I asked Sean at Impulse RC for, because I wanted something that didn't have props in shot. So regardless, if you purchase the Mr. Steel one, it is kind of technically still the Mr. Steel one. It just doesn't come with all the accessories that you see here. And it's not that much more expensive either. I mean, we're not talking electronics like that were in the old one that I think people overlooked. This is just little hardware and not actual electronic hardware. Also comes with these which go over the arms and protect, these are injection molded. They fit over the arms and protect your uh, motor wires. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with the build. First of all, we're gonna need to assemble the frame and you'll notice that the arms have these little holes in them and they have no holes on the other side and then you also have two five inch arms and two six inch arms. Um, yeah, make sure that the hole goes under the motor. The idea behind this hole is that it's not a full all the way through hole because then it, you get protection for your bearings, but it's also a hole there so that in case your uh, set screw that goes in the bottom of the motor sticks out a little bit, which it does on my motor in particular, that it sits in that hole and it doesn't actually butt up against the frame like this and it wouldn't seat down. So yeah, always make sure you have the hole in the right place. And um, yeah, I said earlier that this was a frame specifically that we're going to be building this frame for someone special. I don't even know. I don't like name dropping, but I think 
the person would be excited to know that the frame that we're putting on this video is theirs. Um, this is for Mick Schumacher. So many of you may know his father and you probably know him now because he's in Formula One. But uh, yeah, Mick Schumacher. It's total shout out to him for repping ethics gear and just liking what we do here and liking what I do on the internet, I guess. Let me just dump this all the way out. And uh, so yeah, he hit me up. He didn't ask for a quad or anything. He just had some ethics gear and was asking me questions. And I said, hey, why don't I just freaking build you a dead cat apex because he was going to buy one anyways and i said you know what screw it let's put it together for you so that you can have the perfect experience why not now there's a couple different ways to do this i kind of do it differently every time and i don't i don't know why but uh to sync these you need to put these um these press nuts inside the arms I know it's kind of a pain in the butt that it doesn't come that way already, but yeah, it's unfortunate. But the little things that we have to put up with to do it, to, I don't know, to get nice things, I guess. So I use a steel screw for this because if you use an aluminum screw, you have the chance of stripping it out. And what I did is I took one of the screws out of the kit. This is a two mil screw and I put it on one of these little uh, washers. These are really just the load distribution piece that comes in the kit. I uh, put the press nut inside the arm and then screw this in here as quick as I can. Try to keep pressure with your hand when you're tightening on the wrench because obviously you can strip out the screw that you're doing this with. I think I would prefer to do it with a 2.5 mil, but I just didn't see one off the top of my head so we're going we're going in kind of hardcore with the with the riskier way with the two mil. I ended up switching and using a 2.5 mil screw. There is one in here, so just find a 2.5. I don't recommend the two because obviously it can strip out. I'll just go ahead and admit it's what happened to me. It hasn't happened to me in a long time, so I hadn't had it happen. But yeah, use the 2.5 mil. I put all the press nuts in the arms. And then we're gonna have to put press nuts in this plate, which is the upper bottom plate. So what you gotta notice is there is, they're not identical, so don't put the press nuts in on the wrong side. This side has some tapered holes cut out. We're gonna put the press nuts on the opposite side of the tapered holes, and that'll make sense more here in a minute when we start building the, uh, when we start building everything. So same thing, I used one of these little flared nuggets and a 2.5 mil uh, 2.5 mil bolt and a nice 2.5 driver and yep sink those down to where they're flush with the carbon again make sure you do it on the right side you don't want to do it on the opposite side of where they're where the flare is because then it won't make sense when you build it or it will but you'll be like wow I got to pull those out and put them on the right side because they're on the wrong side probably better to do this with like a, a T driver just because you have more leverage but I got them strong climby hands so I'm okay and make sure you uh, actually put it in the right hole too I've gotten to the point where sometimes <laughs> I put it in the wrong hole uh, yeah you put it in the wrong hole here and then you go to put it together and it doesn't fit right okay so now we've got all the press nuts in they're in the arms they're in this uh, bottom plate now what we want to do is we want to get these four little aluminum screws they're actually kind of tapered you can see them here so they're four these are steel actually so we're gonna use the aluminum ones that come with the mr. steel kit I could tell they were steel because they were heavy so these are the aluminum ones and you don't need the tall ones in this particular case for the build that we're doing and then you're also going to use these four black aluminum beware there are nylon nuts in here too that you don't want to use you want to use the aluminum ones with the lock nut or with the the uh, 
the nylon in them. So we're gonna find the fourth one of these if it stops eluding us. There it is, okay. So we're gonna put these here. And this is where I end up messing up generally. You gotta I make sure you put them in the outside holes. Those are the 32 by 32. And what we're gonna do is just screw on this. And this is what's gonna hold our flight controller. So just kind of screw that on. Make sure you're again on the outside holes. I have done this many times where I put it in one of the closer, more narrow 20 by 20 holes and then it doesn't work obviously. So, and then if you put it all together and you have it screwed into the 20 by 20, then you're really screwed because you got to take it apart to get to it. That's why these things are tapered so that when you build it, the arms actually sit flush against this bottom plate right here and you, you don't have anything poking out. So again, make sure they're all in the outer holes. We're gonna take our 2.5, or sorry, our two mil uh, guy right here, and then I have a T-nut driver, or actually a 5.5 mil here. And we're gonna flop this around, get this. And you remember, everything aluminum, you don't wanna go crazy tight. I don't know how often I've seen people say, oh, these aluminum screws are made of cheese, and sometimes, there are cheesy aluminum screws, but in the Impulse RC world, we they, we use ones from Fastener Express, actually built here in California, and they are really good quality aluminum, and they should not feel like cheese. Again, but it is a two mil aluminum uh, Allen key, so if you pull hard enough or twist hard enough, you can strip it out. So, you know, I get it tight and then just give it one little quarter twist and if you're real anal you can go back and check make sure they're all tight and again check and make sure you have them in the right place because if you do this wrong you're gonna have to take it apart so there we go we've got our bottom top plate set up we have our press nuts on the top here and we have this coming out I know it kind of looks weird but it will make sense here in a second when we start building it now we have this, which is going to be the lower bottom plate. It's actually gonna sit like this. And then the arms are gonna kind of sandwich between. And how this sets up is you have five, five inch arms in the front. Sorry, you have two five inch arms in the front and you have two six inch arms in the back. And how I like to do this is you have these shoulder bolts right here. These bolts are actually smooth in the middle and they're uh, threaded on the end. And what the shoulder bolt does is it actually allows you to get a tighter fit than if you had uh, threads going up and down the entire uh, frame, so, or the entire bolt itself. So again, it's a little bit tighter tolerances, makes the, st the frame stiffer, and at the end of the day, it gives you a more durable and better flying aircraft. Because the stiffer the frame, usually the better it flies. Now what we're gonna do, this is pretty much universal top and bottom. There is a milling side and you can kind of tell the difference, but honestly, it doesn't matter. You can do this either way you want. Uh, I'm gonna put in one of those shoulder bolts with one of these little uh, load distributors. Those were those black cones that come in the box. I'm gonna put one of those in there and then I'm gonna take a five inch arm. And again, you can just put them on top of each other to figure out if you don't know which one is which. And we're gonna run that through, but we're also gonna make sure that uh, how does this work? It goes like this. Yeah. There's multiple ways to do this. I forget. I think this is probably not the most ideal way. These bolts, these 2.5 mils, we're going to run in the middle. Uh, and this may be the better way to do it. You may not use the shoulder bolt initially, but I don't run these load distributors in the middle for some reason. I just never have. Uh, you can if you want. I'm not going to, but we're just going to kind of go around the edge here and I'm going to put in a couple arms. I'm putting the six inch arms in the back and the shoulder bolt thing, like I said, you will be putting those in. So it may not be advantageous to have that in at the moment, but again, I haven't built one of these in a moment. So I'm going to just go with the flow. So I have again, my five inch arms in the front six inch arms in the back. It's looking kind of floppy at the moment, but it'll make more sense here in a second. So we're gonna get those kind of tight. We're gonna get these arms all 
nice and lined up. What's going on here? Okay. And then we're going to take our key and we're going to slip the key in there. I don't even know. Yeah, there we go. So the key sits like this. Now, this is the front of the quad and the five inch arms are here and the key sits with this kind of, there's a taller point in the key. It's not a symmetrical key. There's a taller point. It kind of looks like a crown. The top of the crown goes towards the front of the quad. And we're gonna take our other six inch arm, stick it in there and then put in our last little um, center bolt that I used to tighten everything. Where did it go? It's hiding. Got our shoulder bolts here. Oh wow, there we go. So we get an extra. So this is that's why the Loctite is on these. So we're slipping that in there and we're gonna just kinda give it a little I know it went it went dead and the key probably fell out. No, nope, we're good. Okay, so key's still there. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to slip in some shoulder bolts. There's probably a better way to do this. I'm not a master. I don't build these every single day. So <laughs> take what you will. Obviously, this is my frame. Um, I should probably know how to build these things the best, but I just don't build new quads that often, and I just kind of get by with with what I, what I do. I don't go out of my way to make the perfect build video. I'm just trying to stuff these things together. So now we have all of our bolts in. Our key is still in place. And this is pretty much what it's going to look like. And I am going to actually uh, start tightening a little bit of the center bolts now. Not like crazy, just getting them a little tighter so that they're snug. I'll do like a star pattern. Get them snug. I can feel it's less floppy. And now we are ready to put our top plate of our bottom section on. So that's what it looks like. Six inch arms in the rear, five inch arms in the front with the key in there like that. And now we have this. And if we did it correctly, it sits like right there and it looks, and it's gonna sit flush. Cause again, this is flush right here. So let's flip this over and screw these in. All right, we got all those in there. I'm not tightening them like crazy. I'm just getting them kind of snug. All right, so there's our bottom part of the frame. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tighten from the middle out. So I did that. I did the corner. I did this corner. Then I did this corner. Now I'm going to do this corner. This corner. That corner. And I'm not going crazy tight. I'm just going snug. All right. Now we got our bottom half built. And at this point, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that we could start putting electronics on and building everything before we put our standoffs on just because it makes life easier when it's like this flat. So the next thing I'm gonna do, I buy these on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description below. They're little gummies that go underneath the ESC. Um, and all I do is I just slip one of those over this little center section and slip those guys over there. And all this does is isolate the ESC from the frame. Nothing crazy, but it's gonna give you a little bit of added protection. Um, so this is our FETTEC ESC. I'm gonna pull the quality control sticker off and just preemptively stick it on the bottom in the middle because I know that it's gonna be good. Now what we can do is we can turn on our soldering iron and get this all prepped up. So I'm going to put our uh, frame aside for a second. We're going to get our ESC. Actually, I'll use a piece of wood. I'm just going to get our ESC kind of prepped over here. And I'm going to start uh, flowing some solder on here. I know this looks a little 
haphazard, and it kind of is, because that's just how I am. I work very loosely sometimes. All right, so I've got my iron at 800 degrees, 830 degrees Celsius, which is pretty hot, but I move really quick, so I'm not too worried about it. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pre tin all of our motor connections. And what I'm doing is I'm feeding solder in. And again, you see I'm, I'm moving pretty quick here. If I stay too long in, in one place, it can be bad. So you want your iron hot enough to where it melts the solder very quickly, but you don't want it, you don't want to hold it in the same place for too long, otherwise you can potentially melt other components off. As far as our power leads, I'm gonna run, I'm just gonna flow on top of there. That was our negative lead and then our positive lead. This is flux core solder, so there is some flux in there. Um, I know a lot of people are gonna be, oh, you gotta use flux. Well, I do, just not in this instance. So I, let, I gave it a little second to cool so that I could put a little bit thicker of a blob on there because that's where our XT60 is gonna go and so that it doesn't fall all through the holes. I'm gonna flip it over. I'm actually going to solder the back side too because I like it to cover the whole thing. I don't know why. I've always done that. It's always a pain in the butt. But I like it to cover all the gold or copper or whatever color you wanna call that. And then also depending on where we're gonna put our um, our capacitor on this setup, uh, we're probably going to want to um, probably want to solder a couple of these auxiliary pads. But at the moment, I'm gonna leave them unsoldered because I don't know exactly what I'm going to do yet. Now this we got to make sure that this sits on the frame, and if you notice, it's a little tight. And since we're running these little guys under here, we want it to not be tight. So what I'm going to do is these, these tiny little holes in here, I'm going to take a file that comes with the kit. It's a little cylindrical rat tail style file. Uh, there's a lot of rhyming. And I'm going to file out all of these little, uh, these little circles. So I'm going to file towards the inside and try not to slip out and damage your fets. It's still a little hot for me going hard on the soldering a second ago. So bear with me. The last thing you want to do is slip out of the... There's a lot of innuendo going on on this video. And don't solder it, don't file it too far to where it hits your fet either. So all we're trying to do is get rid of those three little bumps. You should kind of feel it. Yep, there we go. And again, it's not on the inside and outside, it's just the inside, which is the crucial one, because if you file it too far, you can actually hit the FET, and that would be a bad day. So I've always done this on my ESCs, and it's added a little bit of extra protection so again that's what it's gonna look like when it's done you filed out the center there and now when we put it on the frame it sits on there loose and it actually has a little bit of cushion so these are the little things that a lot of people don't do and it makes a big difference when you uh, when you do these things so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to clean these, uh, I'm going to clean this stuff. Oh God, I just dumped a lot of rubbing alcohol on here. It's fine. Rubbing alcohol is, that's a lot. So yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to clean the ESC. I don't do this on everything, but because it's going to someone and I just want to make sure everything's perfect, I'll just clean that like that with some rubbing alcohol. I use 91% isopropyl but you can use 
80% or whatever you want to use. And all I'm doing is it's getting rid of all that excess rosin that is on, or flux, depending on what you want to call it. And it's also getting all the little solder balls, if there were any, off the board itself. So again, isopropyl alcohol is going to evaporate very quickly although I used quite a bit of it so it might take more than a time but I can just dab it off with a with a nice little shop towel all right so once we've done that now I'm gonna solder on our XT60 now I don't exactly know how long we need the XT60 uh, all I know is that we want the XT60 in this particular case I have it coming out in the front we could technically have it come out in the back, which I think I'm going to do because I don't like it coming out in the front. It just doesn't really, it don't work. It don't work none, I like it coming out in the back. So it also keeps our orientation simple. So let's just go ahead and say that we're gonna have it come out in the back. And if we're having it come out in the back, and we set this ESC on here, we have it set up like this to where this plug is down. Uh, basically all we're going to be doing is we're going to have our plug come out about right here. So we're going to cut off about that much, which leaves us, let me get some measuring, let me just get a measuring device so you guys know how much it is. So I don't get any any complaints of someone saying oh i cut off 37 millimeters and you said to cut off 22 and it's not long enough and now we're screwed you can always have too much so our thing is actually going to be 50 millimeters all right let's just go 55 to say that we have a little bit of room so i'm going to cut that off here's our thing we're at about 55 mil. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna cut the white, the red one about five mil shorter, and you'll see why in a second. So I'm gonna strip both these. And I don't wanna strip them too long so that I don't have to worry with this big, this big thing. Now I know someone's gonna complain that they don't have one of these things, and I don't blame you, because I love it, but. It's the solder, buddy, and it works real well. And it was a professor of mine in colleges, and he like made this thing, and it works really well. And now I've just lost my solder, so I'm just gonna get some more. Wow, what's happening over here? Why am I stuck? Ah, gimme, 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 gimme. Okay. So, I'm just gonna feed it in, and again, you gotta feed the solder in. I've done a video on this before of how to solder and I was told, solder, I was told by all the people on the internet how I was so wrong. And I don't see their videos about how to solder. Maybe there are other people's videos out there that complained on my video, but my drones fly okay. I'm sure there are better ways to do things as there are with anything in life. So yeah, got some, just filling in these guys, tinning them is what this is called. So you put solder on both ends of the joint that you're trying to connect. And I always like to flick off the rest, the excess solder. This is gonna be pretty hot now because obviously I was using a lot of temperature. So always wet your tip. Dude, I can't get away from the innuendos in this particular video. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna I'm gonna heat up the positive side, and then I'm going to place the positive side down and just kind of flow it in. You can wiggle it a little bit; it helps the flow. I think Vanover knows about the flow, maybe a little bit. Probably not. And then we're gonna go in here. I'm sorry, this is probably like, you can't see, but wiggle, wiggle, 
fold. And then you end up with something like this. And the reason I cut the, the red one shorter is because the short the red one comes out. I put it at a, like a 45 degree angle so that when it comes out the side, it's less likely to, if you're pulling it real hard and you don't want it to go that far because then it overlaps. So I run it like a 45. You want to make sure they're not touching in the middle, which it looks like we're not, but just to be safe, I'll just run this one more time. We're good. I'm gonna push this forward. I get real anal about these connections. Sometimes I want them to look to look the part. Okay, there we go. I also twist it like this so that the negative side of this connector is in the front. I don't know why, I've just always done that and it works really well for me. So again, this is how your ESC is gonna look. We're gonna go ahead and stick our ESC on here like this. And next we're gonna take these guys, which are little rubber standoffs with threaded metal pieces in them. And we're gonna twist these guys on here. You don't have to put all four of them on if you don't want, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do it because I like a challenge. And what I'm going to do now is just put them tight and then once you get them tight, a little bit of like a quarter turn. What that does is it squishes that little donut down there. Just go back around and make sure you're tight on there. Puts a little pressure on the donut, but it, it also isolates so you have a little bit of strain relief. Next, we're gonna put the motors on. So you open up the Mr. Steel V4 motors and you get these two different pants here. We always try to go with biodegradable boxes. So that's why our boxes are brown this year instead of green, trying to be a little less environmentally draining uh, in the box you get this instead of plastic there's no plastic in the box but you get uh, these two plastic pieces one of them is a lower we call the low pants and then the high pants now what this does is these motors come with no pants if you don't want anything on there you can run it like that no harm no foul if you want a little bit of protection from like mud or something you're more than welcome to use that one that's the one that I generally use if you're wanting a lot of protection, then you can run these. I'm gonna run these for Mick here. I don't know, in case he's going hard. So that is what it's gonna look like, and what it does is just offers a little bit more protection for the motor, and it's also plastic and interchangeable. You can uh, sw switch it at any time. You will have to desolder the motor if you do wanna switch it, but you can easily switch it. So how I'm gonna put the motors on, I'm just gonna get the pants ready, and we're gonna use the these plastic guys right here and when we use these guys we're definitely going to want to use steel screws to hold the motors on and we just go around and find there are some like six i think they're eight mil eight mil bolts there's some that are shorter than others and make sure you get the longer ones um but i don't think there are ones that are too long yeah so what you want is you want about that much poke through and uh what that's going to do is it's going to hold our motors on I, i'm going to run three on each motor and these are 16 by 16 standoff or 16 by 16 motors instead of the previous generation versions were uh were 19 by 19. so what i'm going to do is i'm going to push the screw right here into the center hole there's two holes here they're all cut there's 19 by 19 and 16 by 16 because back in the day they were 19 by 19 on this side and 16 by 16 on the other and you can obviously put the motors on any different way some motors were set up one way some motors were the other these are all 16 by 16. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna screw one of them in. We're not gonna go tight, we're just gonna kinda get it in there. We're gonna take another guy in the opposite corner and we're gonna slip him in. Try to find that screw, line that up, get that going. We've got two in there now and I'm gonna run that third one on the outside. And yeah, so now we've got three screws in this motor. Motor still spins. We go, again, hand tight. We are kind of tensioning on these with plastic because we have this plastic piece down here. So again, you don't want to go super tight, but that is the word on the street right there. We've got that motor on. We're going to go ahead and put the other, other three on, which I could count. 
and then um, and then we'll solder them up. So let me grab these guys, all these longer screws. There should be enough uh, of these long screws in here for you to put four in each. So if you wanted to run all four, you, you're more than welcome to do that. I just have always ran three and never had any issues. So, well, I've all actually ran two. So it's just more recently I've started running three um, because if a motor falls off mid flight or if you crash and a motor falls off, it's never a good day. So I just try to be a little bit more diligent. Um, about having my stuff on there. So let me get all this out of your way. These are again all recyclable stuff here. Try not to create too much extra waste. So again, running the tall bells on these, or the tall bell protectors on these. Don't forget your plastics. Stick your, stick your screws in. And I like to, a little lopsidey sometimes. I like to find that inner one usually. Get in there, bro. But why? And then again, to make this easier, make sure you pull the pull the bolts into the 16 mil holes. Because if you're trying to screw it in and you're stuck on that 19 mil outer ledge, then you're going to be basically like screwing into the motor and not actually getting the thread. You're just kind of screwing into the paint on the bottom. That's not really going to do anything. But aesthetically, if you ever took the motor off, you'd notice that there was a little bit of a a mark like right here where you were trying to screw into something that wasn't a hole so just be aware of that hey hey what's going on oh there's a there's a screw in the way I was like why is it not going here we go all right with that lower one so that you can see pull down and in on that upper one so it goes into the 16 mil hole kind of seated it it just seated a little bit better than it was so And again, you're tightening a steel screw into an aluminum motor. So don't go super tight. Just kind of go tight until it stops. And then maybe a little bit quarter turn after that. Make sure your motors still spin, which that should never be a problem. But if it is, contact your local dealer. I'm kidding. I don't know. You shouldn't have a problem like that. You're not going to have motors that just don't spin out of the box. I mean... You might at some point in life, but if you do, it shouldn't be our motors. And if it is, we will fix you up real fast. So don't worry. I'm just going to try to keep it consistent and go on the outside because with my three screws, so it looks symmetrical oh no oh wow I'm not even using not even screwing the screw that's probably why it wasn't working come on sometimes it helps to reverse spin the 
thread in reverse so that you get it to seat and then so I'm spinning counterclockwise initially to get it to seat in the thread and then once I feel it kind of click in then I'm twisting it clockwise it helps sometimes all right so we've got all of our motors on that's what it looks like from the bottom with all of the motors on Again, right, I'm only running three screws on each motor. Here it is on top with our motor protectors. You can see that this would actually help a good deal if you're crashing into stuff. And again, this is really nice injection molded plastic, so you're not really going to have to worry about it breaking too much. Obviously, certain temperature level, uh, if you get in, like really cold temperatures, then you're going to have to worry about things breaking, but shouldn't be a problem in anything above like 70, or sorry, anything above 50 degrees Fahrenheit or... I don't know what that is, like eight, no, it's less than that. It's like 15 degrees Celsius. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to put these motor uh, wire protectors over the top of the motor's wires. So I'm putting the motor protection over. These come with the kit. Um, you slip it over. I use black electrical tape. I just make sure the motors are all flush inside there. I run two wraps of electrical tape around, snip it on the bottom, and you're done. So let's put those four on. These originally were made for the 5-inch Apex, so they look like they work perfectly on the 5-inch arms, and then they look a little weird on the 6-inch arms, but it still serves the same purpose. It protects the the motor wires from the prop if you were to have a bent prop in a crash and it's like bending down trying to touch your motor wires so we go on here and I like to make sure it's straight I like to make sure all the motors are straight our motor wires are straight sorry Two loops and then we have one more that's missing. Why are you hiding? Why why you why you do this? Why? No. No. My elbows. It's always hiding. There's always something hiding when you're trying to do a build video. What am I am I blind? Am I missing something here? Where it at? missing one I broke it last one on making my life harder my going thank you okay okay so we got all of our motor wires strapped down. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna cut the wires to length. So how I do that is I just grab them, I kind of put them up to where I think they're gonna go. I give a little bit of extra room and then I cut the excess off. So take my pair of side cutters here. I go in, I say, all right, those are gonna go there. I come in here, I cut, and then I'm left with this. And there's a little bit of excess, like I said, uh, on the six inch arms, it's a little longer, so you just want to make sure you've got enough. And we're just cutting off excess fat here so that it's not going to be sticking, sticking over 
at the end of the day, kind of poke it over the edge. Because we don't need all this extra wire, it's just extra weight. Okay, now that we've got that, we go back and strip these. This isn't anything out of the ordinary of like a normal mini quad build these days, I think. So, but you will need to know how to do this stuff if you're flying drones, unless you just want to buy ready to flies all the time and you can just crash and like, I hope at one point I don't want to do this because I think it would be very wasteful, but I would love to get to a point where even if I bend a prop, I just grab a whole new quad. <laughs> so I just have quads to the point where I just, oh, bent a prop, give me another quad. And then I never use that quad ever again. I'm just kidding, I don't wanna do that. But it would be funny. It's like this guy has just never built a quad in his life. He just buys bind and flies and just fully throws them away as soon as he bends the first prop. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tin all of these motor wires. I feel like my iron is getting old or something because it doesn't seem as hot as it normally gets at 850. I'm trying not to breathe the, the smoke or drop solder blobs onto your ESC like I just almost did. Occasionally throw the solder that builds up on the the tip off And try not to solder the two wires that you have together And if you start getting a lot on the tip like right now, there's a lot I just kind of flick it off. I don't know why I do that or where I learned that technique, but it just kind of came natural. <laughs> all right, gonna get this blob off the arm. Now that we have all that, grab a pair of needle nose or a pair of pliers. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the, the motor wires in exactly how they're set up. So straight in, straight in. And this helps with uh, when we go to change the motor direction later, it makes life really easy. So I'm gonna go first wire here to this first hole here. And I'm just gonna get it there and hold it, get it hot, let it go. I know if you use flux, the solder joints look better, but they look like more like that actually. On this side, same thing, furthest out wire to the hole. Furthest out. I kind of like to push them down a little bit so that they're more like that. So that they're not sticking straight out. I don't know, that's just been a thing that I've done since the beginning and it seems to work so maybe there's something to it maybe there's not sorry for my messy desk but uh, that's just how I roll over here sorry I'm kind of in the way The wires are too long sometimes, it makes it a little harder. So that's why I like to cut them short like that one. It's probably a little longer than the other side, just barely. So it's gonna look a little kinked for a second until I go back and fix it. And try not to melt your little rubber, your little rubber guys. Also, for some reason, like stuff never looks the same. Like when you do one side and you do the other side. 
I don't know why it just always looks different. So there you go. That's what you're looking with. That's what you're working with when you got all the motors and the ESC all soldered up. It looks really nice. There's the bottom again. We have this coming off because it'll make more sense when we plug it all in. So what we're going to do next is we're going to grab our flight controller, which it's right here hiding under a bunch of stuff. So we're going to take our flight controller and with our ESC, there was, sorry, there's so much, there's like a mess. What, okay. Yeah. We're looking for this. We're looking for this wire. This is our ESC to flight controller connection. Jesus, calm down there guy. Um, so this is a G4 flight controller. Um, I always have to take off this piece right here because of my video analog, my analog video transmitter. Uh, so there's two power, uh, two eight pin connectors that this plugs into. Uh, there's the top one and the bottom one. How you can tell the difference is there's a USB port on the top here. So this is the top of the flight controller and it goes like one, two, three, four or one, two, three, four, depending on how you look at it. And it's going to sit like this. Now there usually is a, uh, a pin up, a, uh, connector up here sorry I sometimes remove it depending on what I'm putting this on on this particular quad I don't think you need to because you're not dealing with an analog video transmitter being in the way so don't don't freak out that this particular quad is missing um, a pen on the top and the other quads are not so there we go that's how our flight controller is gonna sit now we might not want to bolt it fully on yet because we have a couple of other things to do like put the video tr video stuff in, but I just wanted to talk about you know, the, the what, what we would ultimately do next. But I think now is probably a good time to put our standoffs on. On the front, we're gonna put uh, 35 mil standoffs or I think they're 30 mil. So we're gonna have four longer ones. These are the longer guys. And then we're gonna put those on. Now we're gonna put our chin on the chin is this little plastic piece that goes in the front of the quad and we use these slightly longer steel screws for the chin anytime you're going through plastic or anytime you're going on plastic on this particular build i like to go with um, steel as far as the bolt is concerned because it just makes more sense you're, it's a high wear area it's a high wear piece and aluminum is, is probably just not going to hold up as well as steel on, the, on this particular area so we can save weight in certain areas but on others we just try not to because it's gonna it's gonna break so on the on the back two we're gonna run two little aluminum guys these are the little button super short i think they're like six mil maybe yeah six mil uh, aluminum screws so we'll put those on and again we're using the 30 mil ones in the front and i'm just going to kind of put these on hand tight and there are our front standoffs where our camera plates are gonna go. In the back, we have these like 20 mils and we're gonna run aluminums in the back of this. I always run the shorter aluminum ones in the uh, bottom inside right here. Cause this is a pretty, like, it's a pretty strong area and you're not really gonna be too worried about that breaking. You can run the, the button heads or the cap head. So the difference between the button and the cap. Button is a two mil cap is a 2.5 mil um, I'm just putting these on like this like kind of hand tight and then in the back um, it just depends like sometimes I think honestly they want you to run the, the cap heads on the bottom because I don't think we have enough buttons for the top let's see here I'm so used to running cap heads on everything Okay, so we have enough cap heads to do cap or button. So I guess they give you a little bit of both. So I'm gonna run longer um, button heads in the rear. Uh, the only reason I run longer ones in the back is because this is like a high stress area and you want it to be as strong as it can be. So I'm gonna run a slightly longer, I think this is a, an eight mil rather than a six mil that we ran on the others. Like I said, in the front, I run a longer steel screw and in the back, I run a longer aluminum. So there we go, we have our standoffs in. Now we need to open up our video system so that we can get in here and, um, and put that on. So video system, this is a, wow, Cadex Vista that they've seemingly put together with with 
Superman intended on getting into this. Come on. Let go. Okay. Let go. Let go. I hate this. I hate packaging. I hate it with a passion. Get out of there. Oh my god. Why is that so in there? I'm like putting a lot of effort to try to get that out. Okay. There we go. Useless packaging. Um, we have our thing here and we have our uh, antenna. So how this antenna thing works is you slip the antenna through here and then it sits like that. So you need to pre-do this before you put all this together. And uh, what we're gonna do is we, I slipped it through the antenna holder and it's gonna sit on our standoffs like that. But we all, we need to connect it to our, um, to our Vista now. So there's this little slidey tab that comes out. You wanna use a 1.5 millimeter uh, Allen key to undo this corner piece right here. And then we're gonna take our UFL and just stick the UFL in there. So we've got that on there. We're gonna slip this thing over the top. It puts pressure down on the UFL and we're gonna kind of guide this little pin under. I know this is hard for you to see, but there's a little tiny keyhole pin thing that sits under there. We may have to push it over and then it clicks into place and that locks that UFL down and then we tighten this thing back. And now this UFL is not going anywhere. So that's our the antenna thing. We just needed to put our uh, our antenna, 3D printed antenna holder there first so that you know you wouldn't have to take that off to put this on because it is something that you have to do in order. Now as far as the camera and whatnot goes, um, the camera is gonna sit right here. Vista is gonna sit back here. Um, but the cool thing about this frame, like I said earlier, let me move some of this stuff out of the way, is it comes with this stuff, which this stuff is little 3D printed pieces and uh, little screws that will isolate your Vista from the rest of the aircraft. So we have these four isolation guys that go in here. And again, all this does is isolate your Vista from having ground against the carbon. So we have our four isolation guys. We have our long kind of two mil screws that go in here, or bolts, whatever you want to call them. Looks real nice. And then we're going to hold this up. We're going to slip our little pad over. And this is a little die cut pad that comes with the kit that isolates the Vista from, well, it doesn't isolate anything as it flies off and disappears. But uh, I kind of put all this in here so that I could show you. You can do all of this at once if you choose to do so. And now we have that in there, which is our isolation pad. I'm gonna take my Vista and I'm going to slip it in over here like so. Probably start with the bottom two and work my way up. And uh, now my Vista is kind of locked in place and I'm gonna go slip on these. I know you can't really see because my big fat hands are in the way. But I'm gonna screw these little guys down. These are tiny, little tiny uh, nylon lock nut. You get an extra bolt and an extra nylon lock nut in case you, in case you mess up. Um, now what you're probably going to want to do is grab a nylon lock nut tool and twist those on there. I don't have that on me, so what I'm going to do, <laughs> I don't know if I recommend this or not, but I'm going to grab a pair of needle nose pliers and just squeeze it and just twist until I get fairly tight. I'm going to go to the opposite corner over here, squeeze and twist. 
And again, you are screwing down onto plastic, so you don't want to go too tight. This isn't something you're trying to like crank on. You're just trying to get it semi-tight. Because if you pull it too tight, then it will it'll bust through the bottom here, I'm sure. I've I don't ever done it, so I don't know. You can tell me if you in the comments section have twisted these things too tight before. And it just blows through, I'm sure. Okay. So now our vista is in place. Our camera is just kind of dangling. And what we can do is pull the excess of our antenna in. And then that just kind of sits like this. Um, and then that's pretty much ready to go. You can, I don't know if they run that all the way down or not. But I'm pretty sure we're going to want to put our crossfire antenna back there. So I'm not going to commit to anything yet. I just wanted to kind of put it there to show you what it's going to look like. Because we do have to put this down and our crossfire antenna at some point. Um, I'm going to go ahead and lock this down. Uh, I can't remember if the... Do you know if it goes like that or like this? It can be reversed in the DJI OS. Do you so flip it? it? Uh, up and down doesn't oh, matter on okay. DJI cams. Okay. Well, it makes sense to me that it would be up because otherwise it's going to be like all janky. So uh, what we do, let's just leave that on in case something scratches it. Let's see. 727. All right. Uh, we'll leave here in a second. Okay, so we're gonna put our camera plates on. Camera plates have these little isolation things, like I said earlier. Um, they kind of pop in, they're little 3D printed pieces. And we wanna make sure that we get them in to where they are like are working. I forget if it's on the inside or the outside. I think it's on the inside so that it can't come out. So I think it goes like that. But we'll, we'll figure it out. I haven't built one of these in a moment. So we want to make sure that we can get, that's why I leave all this stuff hand tight because if you tighten it down, the tolerances on these frames are so tight that these camera plates won't fit. So we have that one there and we're gonna pop this in like so. Slip that in there. We're gonna take this camera, kind of test fit it and just see what it's all about. Yep, that looks good. Now we have these four screws, but in this particular camera's case, there's only one screw on the side. So I'm going to go through the middle here. And I can lift this camera plate out and do this outside if I really want to. Kind of screw that in. Screw this in there like that. We'll get that all set. All I did was just make sure everything was gonna fit, so I didn't want it to. I didn't want it to be in a weird position to where. I don't know, maybe the camera didn't fit in there or some something like that. So we got the cam, the K plates on, the cameras in. It's just kind of loose till we get it all set up in there. Seems kind of high. Oh, it's because this isn't in there all the way. All right, so there we go. Our camera is in. I'm sure I'm going to get something about the camera being. I think the camera needs to be the other way. I think the little thing needs to come out the bottom. Because this is going to be tight against it if it's not. So, my bad. Sorry, I haven't built one of these Nebula things before. So, we're just going to flip this camera over. And it will be all good. You ready to go? 
schauen. This is boring as shit. No, you're good, dude. It's boring as shit, don't lie. <laughs> don't lie. Alright. Okay, camera's in. I'm gonna just tighten down on it a little bit. Cameras in. Is that gonna work? I don't think that's gonna work. Something is afoot here. Fuck. I think the Nebula camera has to go on this bottom. On this bottom one. sense okay so on the nebula cam you're probably just gonna go into the bottom the bottom one that way the camera is a little more centered in there there's a, a slot I could be mistaken but that's how I'm gonna rock it on this one I'm sure there's maybe a different camera plate that is out now or something I don't this I think this is just kind of I have an older frame but the Nebula cam fits on that bottom slot and is pretty centralized on the uh, on the uh, thing itself, so I'm not too worried about it. Now we're good on that. Really, all we need to do now is put our FC on and then uh, wire up our um, crossfire. So let's just go ahead and pull the crossfire out now and get that all soldered up just because it does require a little bit of soldering. Oh, well. I don't have an immortal T that I know of. I think I do. Huh. All right, so we're going to run an immortal T uh, on this, on this uh, crossfire right here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tin the tin the wires with some solder that I don't have there we go or I'm going to tin the holes this is the way that I've always done TBS receivers so I don't know you can you can do it the way you would like but this is the way that I've always done it so I tin the the hole and then I know that the square one is the ground so there's a square one and you put the ground there I just heat up the hole and then slip the already pre tinned wire in there these are pre tinned from the factory you gotta be quick though because if you don't make it in the hole quick enough it'll actually heat it up and the other one that you just soldered in will fall out so I've got Black, red, or so it's black, then red, then yellow, then white. And it goes ground, power, uh, RX, and then this is for like telemetry and stuff. So now that we have that done, I just check and make sure all the connections look good. Now I'm going to twist the. Uh, twist the wires because I'm I like things to look good twist them up I'm gonna take my immortal T I would buy the receiver with the immortal T on it this one came with immortal or it came with a standard I'm gonna make sure I get the heat shrink cut the right length just like we can go a little long on it slip the heat stink over here um, 
if you want to be crazy, honestly, I might do that. Just for... Have you ever done that? That's what I normally do. That's what you do? Yeah. J frame dependent. Yeah, but. so sometimes you can run the... You run it back towards itself. I don't know, it just kind of cuts down on the distance between... Actually, I don't know. I don't like it. I'm doing it this way. For that build, it might be better normal. Yeah, so here we go. We're running it like that. I'm going to pop it over here. Melt my face off with the heat gun. Oh god. We had some slippage. To, uh, pinch the ends when I'm done when it's still hot if you got some baby fingers I wouldn't recommend doing this but I have a lot of climbing calluses so I can get away with it and then you come out with something like that um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop this off without breaking anything we're gonna slip this over we have the immortal tea that goes back here. Okay, never mind. <laughs> it doesn't fit on this frame, I forgot. Um, <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slip the immortal tea kind of down there underneath everything. I'm gonna slip this over the top and uh, we can just zip tie the immortal tea in place because pretty much that's how it gets held in place. Anyways. Grab some zip ties here. Gonna run one zip tie up like these. And another zip tie like these. centered up on the back there maybe push it up a tiny bit it's a little more susceptible to get caught in the props but fits a little nicer and then snip these ends okay mortal tees on the back we got our vista we have our antenna here that we should probably work on getting some of that slack out of there. So there we go. All right. So we've got our Vista in there. We've got our yeah, Immortal T in there. And I'm just trying to get this to come up a little bit, but it's fighting me. There we go. All right. Um, now we have the unit here that we're going to lock down with some, some double-sided sticky tape, if I can find it. So what I like to do is I grab this clear 3M stuff. I don't know why I like the clear 3M, but it works well for me. I stick it on the back of here. I'm going to pull this little thing off the top here, and we can put it on top of here if you really want to keep it. And put it on there straight so Mick doesn't have a heart attack. And uh, I'm going to take this razor blade and cut that or well just not really cut it but move it out of the way and move it off I'm gonna stick that down like that all right so 
So now we have our receiver, our transmitter all set. Now we're going to take our, uh, our FC here. We're going to move this out of the way. We're going to stick this guy in. And uh, we have to power the Vista at some point. So I probably should have soldered those wires on before I did all that, but we can get in there and do it. I forget forget about this Vista stuff. So, uh, yeah, for the Vista, all you got is power and ground, right? Unless you want OSD. And then you have this direct plug. Some guy's going to be like, Idiot! Forgot the Vista. <laughs> I mean, legitimately, it's pretty easy to forget. Uh, so, I think that QR code is honestly the build. It like tells you what to put on and what not to put on. Do you know which ones go where? Um, not off the top of my head. I'm gonna look a pin out. Let's pretend these Vista holders. Oh, TX. Oh, you do need a, um, I believe you need one other pin. What? Wait, maybe not. Where does it go? Battery and ground are all put inside. Oh, is it upside down? Alright, I suggest doing this before you put it in the quad, for the record. But, uh, we messed up, so bear with us. Okay. And what are these? I'm assuming red is ground. Or, sorry, red is power. Oh. Okay, red is power. The next one's ground. What's the next one? Video? RX? Uh, next one is... Uh, the next one I put is RX. Which is yellow. Mm -hmm. Then there's TX, then ground and S plus. which is TX And then we can pull these other tabs. Or pull these other guys because we're not going to use them. Because we're not using DJI Link. Or DJI's. It requires 7.4 to 25 volts of power. This does? Mm -hmm. It won't run off of 5. I think the VG4 has a, a plug for it. All right, so uh, like I said earlier, I ripped the connector off the top of my G4, so I had to repin the bottom of this 
this connector right here. So it came with the, sorry, the Vista came with this connector, which gives you like things pinned out a certain way. And um, to work with the G4, you're gonna have to repin some stuff anyways. So how it worked out is you have VCC, which is like basically battery voltage. You have ground and you have RX and TX. Um, on the bottom of the G4, if it's sitting like this in the front of the quad with your ESC connection to the front, if you flip it over 180 degrees, the USB port and this port right here, which is a five pin Molex. So look for the USB, that one goes there. This port plugs in here and the pinout looks like this. So from left to right, the first pin is white, the second pin is yellow, the third pin is, sorry. First pin is white, second pin is yellow, you skip a pin, the fourth pin is red, which is VCC, you skip the next pin and the fully far right one is brown, uh, ground. So you skip a pin in between. So again, from left to right, pin, this is a six pin Molex, sorry, not a five pin. Six pin Molex, it goes one is white, two is yellow, three is blank, four is red, five is blank, six is black. And that works. So we're gonna run our video camera underneath the, uh, underneath the FC. Gonna kind of loosely place this up here. And uh, I did check and uh, it wants the cable on the bottom of the camera to make sure that it's gonna, that it, that's up on the camera for some odd reason. So now we're gonna kind of tuck this stuff in here. Set this guy here. We also wanna solder on a capacitor. So I'll just do that now so that we have the room to do it. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna solder it right here. So I'm literally just going to bend these things. I wanna make sure positive and negative are right. Negative is the one that has these lines on it. Obviously negative, make sure the lead is negative here. And uh, I just wanna make sure I'm gonna bend it to where it seems like it's gonna fit. So we'll bend it a little bit. Probably bend it a little more. And then make sure this is gonna still fit. That should still fit. I'm gonna cut this. I'm gonna tend the end. Generally on capacitors, the longer lead is the negative, um, on especially on electrolytic caps like this. I'm gonna tend this. You just wanna put it somewhere on the, on the ESC. Um, again, making sure negative is negative. And positive is positive. So there we go. We got our cap in there. You could probably leave the leads a little longer if you wanted to, um, so that you don't have to like bend it down like that or whatever. So now I'm going to put my camera back. Again, quad building is all just kind of make it up as you go, make sure that it works, and then learn from your mistakes. Luckily, I've done a lot of things and learned from my mistakes a bunch, so you guys don't have to do that as much. I've been doing this almost almost a decade now, about eight years. Make sure you uh, don't fuck up any of the pins inside here when you plug that in. Okay, so now we have everything here. What I'm going to do now is take my my little nylon lock nuts. Oh, that one's upside down. I'm extra sad about that. I'm gonna put it right side up. Get my other nylon lock nuts. Put these guys on here. They're not like threading on properly for some reason. There we go, it's nylon. It'll eventually thread correctly after you cross thread the shit out of it. I'm cussing more and more now. I'm sorry, guys. There's going to be some five-year-old that watches this video and learns some word that they've never heard before from me, and I apologize in advance to the parents. 
that have been so sheltered that they never cussed in front of their children. Oh, I'm so mean. I can't help it. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder on the uh, the leads for the, the crossfire. So I just needed to measure, see that that was going to fit. Now I go in here and uh, strip these. Come back in with the solder. Make sure you don't drip solder on your on your board. This is dangerous business here. Don't drop the yellow cake, my dude. Okay, then we're gonna tin the flight controller. Not with a giant blob on the end of our soldering iron, but we're gonna tin it with a little tiny blob. We're gonna just tin telemetry, signal, five volt, and ground. And we're gonna take little tiny pliers little grips and we're gonna grab what we think goes where black is usually ground you gonna solder that there and then we can take our five bolt guy and we're gonna solder him here and then we're gonna take our yellow guy which is our signal we're gonna solder him there and then we're gonna take our white guy and solder him to telemetry so now our receiver is all hooked up and we're all good to go this is kind of floating around for some odd reason I don't know get in there get in your home okay there we go all right now if we want we can go in and we can start tightening up a little bit of these. You just want to kind of make sure that the the standoffs are straight, because, like I said, this stuff's toleranced pretty tight, and the uh, the hex standoffs have to be flat side in. Otherwise, they will not they will not hold this uh, box of the front end of this together. I don't know why this is giving me such a hard time. Probably because I tightened. Probably because I tightened the camera nuts or the camera too much. There we go. Okay, camera's in there with a crazy amount of angle. Okay, so there we go. We're good on that. And all we're gonna do is slip this right there. I'm gonna turn all of these cables, and we're pretty much done with this quad. Um, I'm going to just turn it on just to make sure everything turns on and then we'll button it up and set up all the electronics and we're good to go. So let's plug this in with a smoke stopper 6S and then just turn that baby on right there. Everything's blinking good. We got all the beeps. We Our air, air unit is on. Our um, receiver is Blinking, ready to be bound. We have four lights. We got resistance on all the motors. I could bind up all this stuff now, but we will do that in a little bit when we uh, set up all the electronics. So basically, that is your final build with the top plate on it and some straps. And we'll finish that up and show you how to do that. So right now, I'm going to bind everything up. We're going to bind the goggles. We're going to update the. Uh, update the DJI unit, gonna make the ESC the way that I want it to, bind it to the radio. So I have a little smoke stopper thing here, just powering it on so that I can gain access to update the air unit or the Vista unit here. Start activation, allow access. Oh god, it wants my verification. Yeah, I, DM, huh? I have read the 
terms and services and know that you're going to steal all of my things. I have read all of that. Yeah, you watched me read it, right? It's good. Yeah. Complete. All right, so now that it's... Wait, start user survey. Kill yourself. Uh, okay, so that thing is... This thing's up to date. So now my... Um, my Vista unit is at whatever this 1.00.0606. So we're good on that front. Now what we need to do is that was on the DJI assistant. Um, I mean, I, yeah, uh, there are a lot of other videos that'll tell you how to do that. If you don't know how to do that, just type in DJI FPV assistant online and then download it via if you have Mac or you have PC. So it's pretty self-explanatory. As far as the FETTEC configurator, um, there's a FETTEC configurator that's going to allow you to interact with the G4 flight controller and this 45 amp ESC. So when we're going to the ESC, um, you gotta click KISS pass through, and then we're gonna connect, and you have to have power to the drone itself so that the ESC can be seen. Once we're in the ESC, we're gonna select remote firmware and go to the latest one, which happens to be FETTEC 45 amp 1.0.224 at this current moment, which is whatever, March 30th, 2022. Sorry, wow, 2020 came up a real long time ago and went away real fast. So now it's uh, I've so it's selected those ESCs and it's now flashing each individual ESC. And while it's doing that, I can just go ahead and go over here and bind my transmitter. So I've got this set up it says hey you want to bind a micro tx i say yes it says all right we're going so it's currently binding the uh, micro tx and uh, the firmware for the escs is done we're going to go into settings and we're going to take off the slow motor start because i don't personally like that we're going to turn on trapezoidal communication between all of the escs so this is trapezoidal you have to turn it on for each esc all four of them and then we're going to reverse motor direction on one and three. And if you followed the whole build process with all the motors going straight from the motor, or motor wise coming straight from the motor and directly into the ESC without any turns or twists or flip flops, then one and three should be spinning counterclockwise and two and four should be spinning clockwise. So this is going to be props in. I always fly props in. I have flown props out. I don't really see that big of a difference. I do realize that. You don't get sucked into things as easily with props out. However, you do shoot grass all inside your USB port and all over your really important electronics. And if you hit water or anything, it's better to shoot it on the lens, to me at least, than it is to shoot it in the USB port on the side of the aircraft. So that's just my personal opinion. But yeah, a lot of people like to fly props out. Um, okay, so now our, uh, our thing is done. Like we're all bind it up with our crossfire module um, if you don't have a crossfire module that has an L uh, LCD on the back you can do it in the uh, in the radio you just hit page or how do you do it you hold down menu and then it says TBS light agent you click in there and then I can go in here and do the exact same thing so yeah pretty simple stuff now let's turn it all off unplug it I can turn my radio well I'm gonna go do the kiss stuff now so we've we've updated the ESC we have fixed uh, all the firm we've got all the firmware updated on the ESC we've got the air unit activated and we've got the radio bound so the only thing we have left is the flight controller so what you're gonna do is don't have power going to the drone I just have it plugged in it's not currently on with a smoke stopper I'm gonna go in here and open the kiss GUI Hopefully it's up to date at this point. Uh, make sure you click the modem. All right, so on this particular flight controller, I'm on RC47M. So this is a G4 flight controller. Um, to flash the G4 flight controller, you're gonna actually do that in the uh, in the, the, the FETTEC configurator. So when you're in the FETTEC configurator, it'll just say USB, you click that. Um, Wow, hold on. This will be kiss pass through and we'll see if it shows up. 
I remember exactly how to do this on the G4. I just kind of use whatever it comes with these days. I'm still using the KISS, uh, KISS firmware on here currently. I know that there's some people out there that know different. So yeah, now we've gone through. I went KISS pass through. I don't have the quad powered on, so the ESC is not getting power, so it's not going to take you there. And then you have this FETTEC FC G4 firmware version 1.0 whatever. So you select remote firmware and then you can pick what FETTEC firmware. It's really a KISS firmware you want. And in this particular one, the latest is RC47M. Um, so yeah, that's the one that's on there right now. I'm not gonna change it. So just disconnect, go back to the KISS GUI and uh, I'll show you the PIDs and the setup that I have in there for that which is pretty similar to my, um, which is gonna be pretty similar to my freestyle setup. Uh, honestly, it might actually be my freestyle PIDs because I think I took that flight controller from a freestyle rig. Sometimes you gotta unplug stuff and plug it back in to get it to read. Let me just grab my other dead cat so that I can know exactly what the PIDs are. So on this particular one, it has like pitch it four or roll it four, pitch it five five point five. Let me let me plug in this this dead cat and see exactly what I have on here so that I know. So that we know. Alright, so it's slightly different. So this is also on, uh, the rates are slightly different on this thing as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hit back up. I'm gonna save as DC, DC Apex. Wow, Apex, and then whatever the date is, 3, 30, 22. Um, and then, yeah, we'll just save that on the desktop. I think I've got, yeah, whatever. We'll just save it on the desktop. And then uh, all I'm gonna do is go over here, plug this into this DC. I think that's actually on an F7 too, so yeah, you know, whatever. It's all similar. And then um, restore, and we'll just do the DC Apex, and then that brought all that stuff over here. Um, all we wanna do now is just make sure that we hit save and yeah, you can see all of these things. I have the rate slightly slower because this is a cinematic rig and I'm just like cruising around so I don't really need crazy rates. So I have it at one and then 0.7 and then 0.25. I'm still running DSHOT 2400. I'm still running idle up and uh, yeah, here are the PIDs. Then on this page I have a set point for D-term at 80 and then adaptive filter on and then I have the OSD set up on serial one. I have the receiver set up on serial two and then serial three and four. Uh, if you if you don't see this, you have to click serial configuration and use advanced configuration. You say, I know what I'm doing. And then yeah, KISS protocol OSD and then serial five has VTX ESC telemetry. So <clears throat> we're good to go on there. I'm gonna go to data output and I'm just gonna check and make sure everything's good on my radio, which it's currently not. If it doesn't work immediately, just reboot the GUI. I had some weird situation happen where it wasn't showing up and the GUI's like freaking out. So anyways, uh, what we wanna make sure is that when we hold everything down and left, that everything goes to 1000 and we hold everything up and right, it all goes to 2000. And uh, yeah, your radio should be zeroed out and set up correctly to where when you're at center sticks, you're all around 1500. And again, like I said, up and right, it should be 2000 and down and left should be all 1000. However, on mine, I have a idle up switch here. So when I go to the neutral position, it arms the quad, but it doesn't actually spin the gyro up. And then when I go to here, this full position, then it allows me to actually have throttle control. And it is kind of like sketchy because I, if I have my throttle at middle position and I go here, the, the motors will spin at idle. And then as soon as I go there, they're immediately at 
550 or whatever. So you could do like a full launch mode if you wanted to. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Um, and then we have Aux 3 over here, which is what I use turtle mode for. And then uh, I've got Aux 4 here set up for level mode in case uh, for some reason you lose video signal and you're like a million miles away and you just want to pop into level mode and throttle up, see if you can get video back as like a possible fail safe. Um, so what we have here is we have uh, auxiliary three, auxiliary four, and arm on here. And I just wanted to go back and check. So we have auxiliary three, high is turtle mode. Auxiliary four uh, is level mode, high auxiliary four is level mode. And then arm medium and high is there. Yeah, so D-Shot 2400. And for th auto idle up, you have to do min throttle at 1050 and min command at 1065. And then you have to adjust your min throttle in the radio to be uh, 1065 or higher. 10, yeah, 1065, I think. You know, not higher. It'll, it'll have to be 1065. So all we need to do now is uh, bind the goggles, set the goggles down, plug them in, turn the quad on. And you just wait for the goggles to boot up. Once the goggles boot up, which they should be doing any moment now. Okay, now they're booted up. I'm just gonna click this little red button. And then I'm gonna click the little button on here. There's a button on the side of the, the Vista and now they are bound. Now I have video. Okay, so what I'm gonna do in the goggles is I'm actually gonna go to settings and I'm going to go to uh, camera and I'm gonna make it four by three if it's not already. And the other settings and stuff you can, you can leave stock, whatever, it's fine. Transmission, I'm gonna go to uh, preferences, low latency, auto focus mode on off, bit rate, I like to set mine to 50 megabit, but you know, whatever. And uh, depending on the situation, 50 megabit. And then device, I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna turn max power. I have 1200 milliwatt unlocked, but I'll just leave it at 700. And then auto temp control, I'll just leave that on. As far as OSD inside here, I have telemetry for RSSI, I have milliamp consumption and I have um, amp draw, I have battery voltage, I also have time flown, and obviously goggle voltage as well. So we are all set to go. All we need to do now is spool up the motors, make sure they're spinning in the right direction. So unplug it from the computer, counterclockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, clockwise. I actually had someone the other day, they were like, how do you know how the motors are spinning? And they were like putting tape on the top of the motor to figure out which way it was spinning. Just touch it. Like it's not going to do anything. You can stop it. Like even if the motors are not, I mean, even if the gyro is engaged, like you can still touch it. So this one I can tell is spinning counter. This one I can tell is spinning counter. This one I can tell is spinning clockwise. This one I can tell is spinning clockwise. Even if there are props on it, I don't recommend it but you can still touch the very top of the bell. Don't accidentally bump your throttle, but you can still touch the top and see, oh, that one's spinning counter, that one's spinning counter, that one's spinning clockwise, that one's spinning clockwise. So if we wanna, well, it, it turned off because I killed the smoke stopper. But um, if we wanted to check turtle mode, we just arm and then turtle mode. Turtle mode's working. I don't think it'll do yeah, it'll do level mode. So I just engaged level mode. You can hear it freaking out. So yeah, it's good to go. Just button it up and give it a test hover. All right, so earlier this, I mentioned that this antenna was kind of loose in this antenna holder. Um, I mean, this was designed to be used with that little cherry bomb thing that comes with the stock antenna. So obviously if you have a different antenna or particularly this antenna that is, um, is a little bit thicker or sorry a little bit longer I'm just taking a piece of double-sided sticky tape and just kind of sticking it to that shaft and then uh, slipping it inside this tube 
with the double-sided sticky tape, kind of twisting it in there. And uh, what that is doing is it's kind of just sticking in and not really. Then you take like this pair of dikes and cut off the excess or whatever's not stuck in there. It might be kind of not the best, not the best thing, but it's not coming out anymore and it's stuck in there. So that might be a, a temporary fix. Other, you could also like put heat shrink around it or electrical tape and make it, make the shaft thicker so that it doesn't pop out. But I mean, this is, that's not really going anywhere. I mean, maybe if it's really cold, it might pop out, but it's definitely a lot stiffer and not going to pull out unless it just grabs something, which is very unlikely. So anyways, that is our, uh, our top antenna mount situation going on. I'll just, you know, slip that on the side. We've already bound up everything. So really all we need to do is put the top plate on, um, and put our straps through and then, uh, yeah, put it together and should be good to go. So we've got this mount right here, which we will also mount up. And I will kind of show you guys the beta that I use for these mounts. Um, so like I said earlier, we're gonna use aluminum screws for this because this is the Mr. Steel lightweight edition. And where's my two mil driver? Where are you hanging out at, bro? Why are you I hiding? I think I pirated it. Oh no. Pirated my two mil. All right. So we're gonna put a longer, like, uh, I think it's like an eight mil, uh, Allen, or sorry, button head in the back. So I'm gonna run these button heads in the back right here. And I, again, I said I ran a little bit longer ones and these are the aluminum screws and how you can tell they're aluminum is because they're like fully solid black. And the other ones that are steel are kind of like, they have a sheen to them and these are like almost like a mat. Then I'm running the slightly shorter ones on the middle section right here on this one spot right behind the flight controller, those two standoffs. And then what I'm gonna do for this mount is I'm actually gonna run cap heads, which are these guys, but I'm gonna run longer cap heads. So there are some cap heads that are used for motor screws. They're slightly longer. They look like that. I know everything's black and it's kind of hard to see, but you kind of get the idea. So the rear one is gonna be just two cap heads aluminum, and then the front, I'm gonna use a longer cap head. So I'm gonna use these cap heads that are longer, and I'm gonna take two of these guys. They're little, the little things that you're supposed to put on the bottom of the frame to uh, stop it from, or to give it more stability as far as like weight load distribution for the screws. I'm gonna run two of those on the front like this. And what that's going to do is it's going to prevent if you hit something with a GoPro so it doesn't rip the TPU. Because TPU is probably the weakest point. That's the weakest point on this drone is that TPU as far as it, you know, it's going to rip out if you hit something hard enough. And uh, this will prevent that from happening as easily. So again, this is on TPU. You're not trying to like crazy tighten it. If you wanted to, you could put it down in the back too. You could also run some steel screws in the back if you're scared, but I feel like the aluminum ones are more than adequate. You just kind of get them a little tight. You don't need to over crank down on them. And then that's our two TPU mounted pieces. Now I'm going to put uh, Velcro on. I may, I always use Velcro, but a lot of people like to use the rubber, but I find that the rubber in any kind of cold environment doesn't really, it doesn't really stick. It just kind of acts like a slippery surface. Anytime I'm using any adhesive, I always heat it up just for better adhesion. I heat both side, both surfaces. I don't have to heat it up like crazy, just enough. And then slip this guy on here like so. Get him all nice and straight on there 
All right, cool. So now we're all Velcroed up. We're gonna run our 250 mil strap with the buckle on the outside from the left of the quad to the right, and I'll explain to you why here in a moment. And then we're gonna run our buckle opposite on the 230 mil strap. This will be on the, the XT60 side. So we're running like that. So we have a 230 and a 230 or 230 and 250. And then we're gonna take one zip tie and zip tie our lead. We're gonna zip tie our XT60 lead to this rear standoff. Give the XT60 lead a few twists. I bend the uh, the tip of the zip tie so it's easier to feed through. And all I'm gonna do is I'm going to zip tie that lead to that rear standoff. And all that does is just keep it from, if you eject a battery, it's not going to rip the leads off of your uh, ESC, or your, yeah, your ESC. So that is the quad as it sits. And the reason I do the battery straps this way, I'll show you right now with the battery. So if you take a battery and you undo your straps, you put a battery on here. Remember, you always want to CG the quad. So on this particular quad, the CG is going to be slightly further back than it would be on another quad, especially when you have a GoPro because the motors have slight, sli shifted slightly back. As you can see, they're still in parallel with each other, but they are shifted further back than like your standard Apex. So the CG is going to be a little bit further back, so you may need to adjust where these straps are, which obviously you can. Um, but the reason I do this is one, I always go with the back strap first, and then I crank it down like that. 230 mil fits perfectly over that battery, which again, is specific on the batteries I use. And then this 250, the reason I do it like this is it gives me some opposing pressure, so, so I'm not always tweaking the battery one way. Now I'm pulling it back this way, and then I get it started, and then I run the battery lead underneath like this. And now when I plug it in, my battery lead is tucked super tight to the airframe and it's not going to go anywhere. And when I want to undo it, if I needed to get to it in some kind of emergency, I just just pull this one tab and now it's loose and I can pull. There's a You can also run it underneath, like I've had other airframes where for some reason I had to run it underneath like this and then tighten it down but you can never get as tight of a grab on the battery if you do that. You can get it pretty tight, but then if you have a problem, you know, you gotta undo everything and do that. So I just find it's easier to run the strap in like this, get a tight bite on the battery, and then run the lead underneath it. Keeps everything nice and tucked, and you're good to go. So let's give this thing a little test hover. We'll throw a GoPro on it real quick and uh, get it up in the air, put some props on it. All right, so this is a special custom made aluminum screw that Impulse RC made. It's again eight mil on one side and then it's actually got a 2.5 mil Allen key in the middle. Pretty nice, Pretty it comes in handy. So we're gonna slip this GoPro in here. Again, you can get a better GoPro mount if you want. I generally, don't run a GoPro on these HD frames unless I'm pretty much not going to crash. So I get it if you're you're a little wary, and you don't have to uh, you don't have to crank down on getting this thing super tight. Like it will slip inside the mount. Sometimes it does. It's actually not slipping now. So if it does slip again, you don't need it like super tight. It holds the GoPro really well, even if it's like it's not going anywhere under any kind of wind conditions. Um, but you can tighten it down pretty hard. I think the newer res re the newer revision that I have is not slipping, so that's nice. Uh, so yeah, we got a GoPro on there. I'm gonna recommend that people fly the P4 for this particular setup, which is this candy cane prop. Um, I have all of our ethics props 
are designed with some kind of color scheme, two-tone color scheme in mind, except for the S5, which is like our quote-unquote cinema prop, five-inch prop. These are 5.1, um, 5.1 inch props, and these are a mild pitch. The P3, which is our peanut butter and jelly prop, which is what I fly on my freestyle rigs, is a slightly lower pitch, but the same airfoil as this particular P. Obviously, you see that P, P3, P4. Usually the higher the number, the higher the pitch. And uh, let me grab a prop tool. Crank down on this prop tool real fast. It's a little harder to crank down on the props or the prop nut when you have the, the big uh, the big pants on there, but it's all still doable. You gotta have some sacrifices if you're trying to protect your bells. So we are good to go for a hover test. Uh, I've actually got a fully charged battery I'm gonna throw in here so we're not running a dead one in the dirt. So I'm going to make sure this is CG'd right. So I'm going to pick the quad up. The CG is actually further back on this quad, like I said, because the motors are further back. So you're going to grab slightly behind the center. And it looks like it CG's like right there with this particular battery. Obviously, it's going to be a little different depending on your battery. But you want the CG to be slightly aft rather than uh, right in the middle, right over the flight controller. Because like I said, you're centering it with the center of the prop line rather than the center of the airframe. So we slop that in there. Give that a nice little plug. Make sure we're all tight. Our CG's good, perfectly in the center of the line. Make sure we are spooling. Make sure we're spinning the right direction. Like I said, you can touch it. It's not gonna freak out. You always hold it. I always hold it down for good measure. All right. So if you want to be like real cautious, I like to do this, but you don't have to. So I just put my foot on the quad, arm it. I give it a little bit of pitch forward to make sure the rear props are spinning. A little pitch back, make sure the front props are spinning more. Right and left props should spin, and then make sure everything's good and then uh, you can like just slowly add a little bit of something and see what it does and it act it's acting correctly so now we can pick it up on there or I would do a flip for you in the garage but is done ready to go you've just built yourself a dead cat apex mr steel edition with fet tech and dji and you're ready to live stream and have no props in shot carry a gopro and let me show you the all up weight before we go so i'm a messy builder as you can see so forgive my messiness so this is a hero 10 with a battery and a 1300 thunder power 
Again, the heavy pants with some aluminum hardware. And this is all up weight. We're at 722.5 grams. And again, that is a full size GoPro. The GoPro itself weighs 180 something grams. So if you take that off, the aircraft is significantly lighter. And uh, yeah, it's really not any heavier than a standard Apex. It's just because we're running such a fat camera on here, um, which I've got another one that we can measure just so you know how much it is what was it seven seven twenty two seven twenty two seven twenty two with without the camera so it's 150 how is it so light right now what's going on here do we have the right battery in here i don't think gopro tins were that that light 156 okay so 722, so that's like what? 622, 6540? So 560? I don't know what that is. I can't do math in my head. So 722 minus 156. Anyways, yeah, that's what the aircraft weighs with that battery on it. Cool. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. See you in the next one. All right, just for the people that I know are gonna ask, this is dry weight with props on it, but no camera, no battery. 388. That's with a Vista. If you wanted one with an air unit, this doesn't have props on it, so add about 12 grams. So you're at 398, so 12 grams on top of that. It's roughly, what, 410? with a air unit and then 388 with a uh, with a Vista. So yeah, it's pretty light. Honestly, super durable. You're not gonna have any issues with, uh, but you can't isolate, you can't isolate the air unit. You can isolate the Vista, as you can see. And you can also make it lighter and not run these. These weigh about, about a gram and a half extra per so you're you know you're talking five grams if you didn't run the pants with three motors you could shave another five to ten grams off there um, well actually like 20 grams if you don't run the, the skids so you could probably get it down to like 340 if you really tried but this setup works so well i love the skids i have no complaints and i honestly have just learned to live with that extra little bit of weight at the end of the arms because it makes life so much more fun when you're able to slide on the ground Anyways, thanks for watching. See you in the next one.